You're listening to the Afterburn Podcast, episode number three. I get out and, uh, you know, like right before I get out, I'm doing the system check. I'm like, all right, well, I can feel my toes. I got arms. I can see and I can see a hole in my uh, goggles. I'm like, well, I'm seeing the hole, so we're good there. And then like starting to check all my teeth, jaw, like, you know, doing this in five seconds, right? And I'm like, got a lot of blood coming out of my head and my mouth well i i'm good for now so i i get out go to shoulder my rifle to shoot whoever's running away from the scene right so that's the voice of steve reichert who's the guest on today's podcast and he's talking about his experience immediately following uh his vehicle rolling over an ied steve is credited with a kill of over 1600 meters when he was fighting some insurgents in iraq in 2004 he has done some incredible things, not only in his Marine Corps career, but post-Marine Corps career. He's staying pretty busy. He's going to talk a little bit about that on the podcast today, which I think you'll find fascinating as we take a different perspective and we're looking from the ground up. Before we get rolling in the podcast today, a few admin notes. I would like to thank my Patreon supporters. Again, just created that account over at patreon.com backslash the Afterburn podcast. For those of you that are looking for some additional content or looking to get involved in some of the episode development, uh, joining at the punk level, I'd like to thank uh, Kenneth Dahl, Kent Bell, Standing Cow, and then the Fighter Pilot Podcast for their support. The next level, the patch, Kurt Billard and William Kwan. And finally, at the Director of Ops level, Luis Cerda. Patreon gives me another opportunity there to put uh, content out. You're going to get episodes right when they're released, they're unedited. Um, when you join like the director ops level, you're going to be able to see who's coming on the show and ask questions. So if you're looking for more content, swing over to patreon.com backslash the afterburn podcast. And finally, I'd like to thank my sponsor for today's episode, wingman watches swing over to wingmanwatch.com If you're looking to build a custom watch for your group, your organization, uh, again, military fire, police, a sports organization, whatever it might be, if you have a group and you want a custom watch, they're the place to go. Cause you're going to get a timepiece with Swiss movements that's custom built for you and your team that you absolutely love at a fraction of the cost that you'll pay elsewhere. It's a veteran owned company, veteran run. Again, you won't be disappointed. Swing over to wingmanwatch.com. They already have some watches over there that if you like, you can use the code rain 10 and get 10% off your order. Well, with all the admin knocked out, uh, over to today's podcast with Retired Marine, Steve Reichert. I hope you enjoy. And again, wherever you're listening, hit subscribe and leave me a review. It really uh, helps out with the podcast. So with that said, over to the interview. Well, uh, yeah, you ready to get after this? Oh, yeah. Whenever you are, dude. Well, well Steve, thanks for uh, joining me on the podcast. Excited to hear a little bit about your uh, journey and where you are today, as well as some of the stuff you've done in the past. Before we get rolling into that, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and uh, what you're doing today? Yeah, so Steve Reichert, uh, originally from Boston area, um, jumped into the Marines in 98, did uh, almost eight years to the day before getting medically retired, uh, did a few things after that with uh, on the private sector with government programs, uh, training companies, and uh, spend most of my time these days up in DC working on other government programs, uh, just trying to connect dots and make things happen for the boss. No, that's awesome. I know one of the big things that you're doing that is kind of a volunteer, not necessarily a work aspect, although it is work, is the Brothers in Arms Foundation. Can you tell me a little bit about the Brothers in Arms Foundation? Yeah, so that's uh, the foundation of got established in uh, 2009, so pushing 11 years now, um, to support the Marine Special Operations community and their families where the government kind of 
leaves off. You know, the DOD can do tremendous things, but at some point, like, their support needs to cut off. So the foundation sort of fills the gaps and doing everything from tuition assistance for Gold Star family members, moving folks around the country, uh, you know, taking care of mortgages, building houses, um, you know, you name it and everything in between, just to make the lives a little bit easier for those Gold Star family members or even the active duty guys. If uh, I think it was last year, there were two guys overseas in Iraq that got notified that, uh, you know, their wives are going into labor and the command gave them the time off to get back home, but you know, they had to pay for their commercial flights out of Iraq. Um, so little tiny things like that, you know, picking up things short notice, uh, you know, whatever we can do to help make life easier for those in the community. That's where we focus on. Yeah, that's awesome. So brothers in arms foundation, if people are looking to support veterans or even active duty, uh, members who might need some help, uh, <clears throat> go over and check that out. And I imagine, uh, obviously, your time in the Marine Corps led uh, to the drive to create the Brothers in Arms Foundation. Can you tell me, when did you join the Marine Corps? What was some of the decision that went into you wanting yeah, to Yeah, so this, that? this rolls back to uh, maybe I was five or six. I was sitting in a small little suburban town outside of Boston uh, watching a train go through town, and on Somewhere in the middle of the train, there was a flat car with an old Sherman tank on it, right? And I'm probably going to a museum or something. I saw that thing roll by. I was like, I want to drive that, right? So I guess that <laughs> started. I was focused on the military after that. And then maybe when I was 10 or 11, I saw a Marine in dress blues somewhere in town. I was like, that is awesome. And from that point on, I kind of started focusing on the Marines and that was the end of it. So joined when I was uh, 17, uh, went into the infantry. Initially, was out in California for a few years, then got selected for the uh, Marine Embassy Guard program, did uh, three tours overseas in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, Karachi, Pakistan, Istanbul, Turkey, picked up a meritorious staff starting four years, which is kind of quick. So when I did get back to the fleet reign, uh, when I left the fleet, you know, I was a corporal, fire team leader, squad leader, et cetera. And when I came back, I was a platoon sergeant. So some of my fire team leaders were actually a year or two older than me. So it was a little bit uh, odd, but it was a good career. And then, uh, yeah, a few deployments overseas. Uh, I was out in Iraq in 2004 uh, as a platoon sergeant. The History Channel did a spot on that. Um, that was an interesting deployment to say the least. Yeah. I definitely like to talk about that a minute, but I didn't realize you were an embassy guard. How was the the three tours? Those are three unique and interesting places to be stationed. Oh yeah. Yeah. So back then, I mean, they changed things up now back then you had two tours, you know, 15 month tours. Um, but, uh, Karachi, Pakistan was a hardship tour, obviously. And I got there maybe two months, three months prior to 9-11. So uh, being in the middle of the hornet's nest for 9-11 was you know, very unique. Obviously, the threat levels went up, but just seeing the folks celebrating in the streets as the towers were falling, it was like yeah, semi-depressing, but uh, we pushed through it and then helped get uh, all the other government groups into the country and get them across the border almost three weeks later. So it was, it was interesting seeing all this transpire in front of your eyes, you're not really read in on what was going on, but you just see all the moving parts throughout the embassies and the consulates. And, uh, you know, years later when things come out in other people's books, uh, you know, putting two and two together was like, I know those guys, that's not the real name, but those guys were awesome and they drank heavily. Right. Yeah. I, did you live in the embassy or did you guys live off the economy when you were stationed there? Yeah. So in Karachi, uh, we lived, there was an American compound, maybe, straight shot 500 yards away from the consulate there. So technically it was out in town. Um, so we, there was a commute back and forth and we had a fully up armored, uh, Chevy suburban and typically we travel arm back and forth. So it, it got unique. Um, the security level, obviously after nine 11 ramped up, but was it busy there beforehand? 
Um, not really. I mean, you use the standard, you know, DEA flowing in and out doing counter narcotics up in Peshawar and everywhere else. Uh, wasn't too busy, but you know, they, the constantly got blown up. Um, two, uh, I think a week before I left, right. Uh, you know, the, the regional security officer RSO for state department out there, one of the best guys out there, very forward thinking, he made sure that one side of the consulate where it was too close to the road, he couldn't do anything about it. He made sure that the entire side of the consulate was empty, despite State Department pushing back and complaining that they're doubling up on offices. But when that uh, vehicle-borne IED went off and everything in those offices was shredded, you know, everybody praised him after that. So it was a, it was a unique tour, right? And from there... Um, Polar opposites, right? They, they got selected to go to St. Petersburg, Russia. So, you know, Korea, China, Russia, any of those um, higher counterintelligence threat posts, you know, you got to go back to Virginia for some additional training before you roll out. And I was out in Russia for almost 14 months and uh, absolutely loved that tour. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, I imagine completely uh, unique and something different. And I'm imagining you're probably not blending in to uh, at least in Karachi, uh, maybe a little bit more in Russia, because I imagine you got a pretty good high and tight going on at that point. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, in Russia, we actually blended in. Uh, it was a unique on the CI part because the Russians, FSB, you know, prior, they were the KGB, their training academy was four blocks down from the consulate. So, you know, every American there, especially working for the consulate, had, you know, we were the guinea pigs for the new trainees all the time. Um, so we just got used to life being watched um, at all times. But I had a unique opportunity while I was out there to go through the Russian uh, Spetsnaz special, I think, subunit uh, jump school out there. And while I was out there for the remainder of the tour, we pulled off 200. 12 jumps with them and uh awesome guys crazy as hell um <laughs> but it was it was definitely fun that's cool that you're able to do that um yeah because you figure all the times uh doing air shows is the only time i've actually interacted with other nations and specifically like getting tours of like the su-35 and with the chief test pilot for the sukhoi design bureau it's like in the end right no matter what these guys are just pilots and those guys you know, they're just gun toting dudes who are fighting for their country. But, you know, you put us all yeah, in the room, exactly. we're all kind of doing the same thing. Put it on the battlefield, it's another story. But, uh, yeah, I mean, and it's just the way they do things, Rain. I mean, uh, so when we learned how to pack parachutes, right? Like they, they taught us how to do it and we did it, you know, no issues whatsoever. When I got back to the U.S. and uh, went to one of the local drop zones, they saw me trash packing the main and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, this is this is how you do it. Isn't <laughs> hot. Uh, you know, I was, they were very surprised that I was doing that. I mean, granted it takes you like two, two and a half minutes to trash pack the things, but, uh, you know, little did I know. And another unique thing too, about jumping out there is, uh, you know, would never do this here in the U S but for every hundred, 500 and a thousand jumps out there, if you're hitting any one of those wickets, you are taking a nice big bottle of vodka with you up in the stick. Right. And, as you're going up, you know, everybody's taking a swig and passing it right next to it. So you start with the back, right? Take a swig, pass it. Eventually it goes back to the front of the plane, right? Then you see the co-pilot put his arm back. It goes into the cockpit. The pilots take two heavy swigs and then it goes to the other side and just round and round until it's empty. And then they throw it out the back. Um, so there's <laughs> been a few times where I've been up. I don't really drink and I've been up at altitude because there's like four or five guys hitting those wickets and like, I'm buzzed and you know, we're pushing out at 15 K I was like, this is not <laughs> whatever they're used to it, but this, this is, would never happen in America. Yeah. This is how the story ends. What happened to Steve? <laughs> well, he went jumping with some Russians and into the ground. He went a eh, whole nother right. world. Yeah, whole he was too world. drunk to pull <laughs> <laughs> different worlds. Yeah, so different that, worlds. Yeah. No, I mean, it was a good tour. I mean, that's a good little program that the Marine Corps has, uh, you yeah, know, very selective. You you wrap up your embassy tours, um, and then you are uh, 
back home and then you guys deploy, like you kind of alluded to in 2004, you find yourself in Iraq. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit. What was it like getting established there on the first deployment? How many, how many times did you guys go out on patrol routinely or what was that like? Yeah. I mean, back then, again, this was like what a year after the, the initial push in Iraq happened. So everybody's still for the most part trying to figure their, their way around doing things and operations. So uh, pretty much every day, the, the platoon, the company, we'd roll out on patrol. Um, unlike the Army, I'm not bashing them that much, but uh, at the time, they would just do vehicle patrols, and they would never step out of their Humvees. They never really got to know the locals, but uh, at the time, Mattis and crew um, really wanted to establish a presence there so aside from using the humvees to get to a location once you know once we were in the small town or village we were on foot patrolling around trying to interact with locals uh, they didn't always like us there which you know me p- tossing myself in their shoes I, I would agree i mean if foreigners were you know walking around boston with guns uh, i probably wouldn't like them there as well so you know it yeah. was uh it was interesting it didn't get uh, I mean, there were firefights and IEDs almost weekly. Um, you know, never expect, well, you join the Marines, right? You're, what else are you going to do? But uh, remember the first time we got into a rolling gun battle, my lieutenant, nice guy, but uh, if you pictured the uh, office manager Lumberg from Office Space, <laughs> like that was my lieutenant. Like, Again, super, super nice guy, but mannerisms, tone of voice, everything was like that. So we get start getting sprayed one night with the uh, machine gun fire. We have tracers rolling overhead, and Lieutenant and I duck down, and I can see he's panicked. And I'm like, hey, sir, I think they're trying to kill us. And like I'm laughing, and he's just not having any bit of But, you know, there <laughs> occurrences like that weekly, and uh, you just roll with the punches, right? This, the mission I want to talk about, April 9th, 2004, Latifia. Were you guys pretty much in one village or one you know, stay in the same AOR area of operations or were you guys kind of roaming and tasked to different places? Yeah. So that week there was a, uh, I forget the name of the pilgrimage, but there, a lot of locals were rolling up the main highway there, right. Uh, to get to another location. So the company was tasked in general with providing, uh, security in the general vicinity. And then my platoon, we were working out of, uh, an oil field, for a few days and the, the night prior to uh well april 8th right uh we launched a squad out there where the engagement happened the night before and myself and one of the other marines were just on top of the tower just eyes on the entire area just it was a good vantage point right so as the squad got back into the area there was a two guys on a motorcycle that kind of rolled up and Drove past him, and then there was an explosion. It was the guy in the back tossed a grenade, and that kicked everything off. And uh, when it started, they were maybe eight, 900 yards out. They weren't that far away. So, you know, Tucker and I, we had uh, a 50 up there with us that the sniper platoon kindly let us borrow. Um, so we had that up there with us and a, an M40, a 762 bolt gun. So we went to work just keeping. The rooftops clear and taking out any targets of opportunity. Um, and again, Murphy's Law once again. All the radios went out uh, for the second time. So you can't, you can't make this stuff up. The, the evening prior, they went out and then we're back up. They're working fine all morning. <laughs> once there's rounds in the air, they give it out again. So that kicked off, you know, mid morning, and um, the QRF or quick reaction force got called in from the north and then they got hemmed up up north and there was some DARPA EOD type special device on one of the vehicles uh, that was rolling in unbeknownst to anybody. Right. So when that section of the convoy went down, now priority was securing whatever's in that vehicle. Like, you know, I, I didn't know this till after the fact, but I was wondering why, the guys were pushing further north away from everybody when one of the heavier uh, cat teams or combined anti-armor teams rolled in. They had 50s Mark 19s on their up guns. 
they didn't know that we were on the tower and they must have been thousand eleven hundred yards out so anytime our 50s were going off to try to take out targets near them uh, one of the gunners on the m2 somehow picked this up and then started slinging 50 cals back at us and this must have gone on for Jeez. 15 minutes uh until one of the sergeants in my platoon realized what was going on as the rounds were crashing into the oil tank i'm sitting there like hoping that this giant massive fuel air bomb that we're sitting on right now that those you know ap rounds that are coming in here don't penetrate this old tank and you know cook us cook off uh, yeah cook, cook off make yeah, a big no, explosion it, it, yeah it didn't happen um and the day progressed further and further and i think uh towards the end of the day i saw what i, what I thought was three guys with a rpk or something slung across their shoulder and I knew where our guys were because they'd kind of hunkered down in a little school building and these guys were rolling up to get uh, on the high point, right? So we just kept slamming rounds their way. But the the round that did connect with those guys was probably the eighth round of the magazine. Um, but that wouldn't look good for TV. So they made it the first round. But physics being physics, you put enough stuff in the air, something or somebody's bound to get hit. That you're on the oil tank, right? Which is about 1,600 meters away from these individuals you're talking about. And yeah. you have a Barrett 50 cal. Right. Yeah. I mean, being on top of the tower, it, it, it's bouncing the shock wave and the muzzle blast like right back at you. So every round rolling down there was painful. Um, but, you know, keep keep pushing through. And then a nice thing too, Rain, with the, uh, the rounds that we had, we had a you know, mags full of uh, Mark 211 Ralphus rounds. So they're high explosive, armor piercing, incendiary rounds. So that as if they hit anything semi hard downrange, they spark. So we did have, we were able to pick up splashes most of the time. So again, just walk rounds onto targets. And I think by that time, we were almost bingo on 50 cal. And, you know, Trying to send seven six two that far out was pointless, so we pulled off the tower. And um, at that point, we were the only two dudes in the entire oil field. Which you know, that six cents, right? You get the hair going up in the back of your neck. So we walked. Oh, we laid low for a little bit. Everyone else pushed north, right? Yeah, but the the oil field there is the refinery is surrounded and guarded by local armed Iraqis. You know assuming that they're good people, right? But um, so as sun setting, Tucker and I were thinking, we, we've got to get out of here. So let's go over to the security office, jack the keys to one of the cars, and we'll just make our way back to the FOB. Yeah, so as we walked over to the security office, you could see that the six or seven guys there were very surprised to see two Marines come out, right? And Tucker's got the... 40 the bulk and i've got the 50 slung over my back and they're lo they're looking at us and they're looking for the other marines like we knew there's you know, 30 or 40 of you here but where's everybody else so i immediately jump on my non-working radio and start you know talking to the other marines that can't hear me and i'm pointing at the rifle and then pointing at like space you know distant spots far off uh and trying to get the iraqis to see the other Marines over there with this big rifle. And then, you know, then if you look over there, there's another one of these right there. Everybody wave, right? So uh, just doing that for like 30 seconds changed the entire interaction with them. And I, I think it put them back on their heels. Like, all right, if we try to kill these two Americans because we outgunned them, you know, we're going to get killed like immediately. So how far away was everyone, everyone else? But that time when the sun set, they were maybe two miles north of us. Again, they're pushing towards that vehicle, the DARPA vehicle. Right. That has a special device on it. That's the whole objective now? Yeah, I mean, that was why they pushed up there. Um, you know, we didn't know. So after we, you know, sorted the deal out with the guards of the field, uh, here comes three Humvees pulling back into the oil field. And, you know, one of the Marines I knew and jumped in there and, returned back to base that evening and uh that was a slight kick in the nuts because one of the 
Marines and one of the other platoons, right? Like I heard that he got killed in the engagement. Me being the platoon sergeant, when I got back to the the fob there, you know, I'm picking up my platoon's mail and then right next to my stack is his platoon's mail and there's a letter right on the top to Corporal Spear with like lipstick marks on it from his wife. And I'm like, damn. You know, she's gonna be getting a knock on the door and like six to 12 hours that is not going to be good. Man. Um, was he killed? I guess once they pushed forward North in town, you said he was another from another platoon, right? The one that joined right. your platoon. Am yeah. I tracking that? Yeah. He was one of the uh, Marines that came in after the quick reaction force got called. Yeah, man. I mean, and but that kind of like set me, it made me wonder, right? Like if I, and you always have to get yourself like if I could have done more from afar or maybe hit that dude that shot, you know, would Spear be here today? So, you know, it's always like, all right, from that point on, more training, myself, the Marines, like balls to the walls, right? So after uh, after I got out, that was one of the main driving forces for starting a training company. Yeah, so you um you're up there on that that tank which part and again you're just doing overwatch and you mentioned you didn't have any formal training or in-depth training right yeah no, I mean, sniper, wasn't school, a but... sniper i mean despite what some people in their basements may say um yeah i mean i grew up shooting service rifle competition long range shooting i mean since i was 11 so you know being behind a rifle and figuring wind out at distance not an overly complicated thing um especially when you have you know years behind the gun at distance so yep yeah you say it's not complicated but then you're able to kill someone from a mile away again uh, not something that <laughs> eighth round in the magazine maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's still uh, it still counts what i mean is a sniper not normally integrated into a platoon? Was there a reason why you, know, no, you I mean, guys didn't so have the that? Way, I mean, I have no idea how it worked back then, but uh, you, you had a sniper platoon in a battalion, and depending on what the operations were going on, they might take a a team platoon, would probably insert a team or two, you know, under the cover of darkness the day prior, just to get eyes on the area, kind of establish patterns for locals, and then once they've got that established, once your platoon is rolling into the area, they can easily identify if there's any shift in patterns and you know, they've got your back while you're there. Yeah. So on that day, was it just kind of self-initiative saying, Hey, it'd be helpful to have some armed overall that, that was with, my uh, with a long pitch gun? to the guys like, Hey, we're working out of this oil field for the week. Like it, I know where you guys are tasked elsewhere. Like if you don't have, one of the 107s previously committed. Can I take it with me? So, you know, no issues there. Well, shift gears. Can you tell me what it's like getting blown up by an IED? I think it was uh, June or July of that summer. You know, I was, the IEDs were constantly getting hit, right? So, um, if we just lost another vehicle the day prior. So, you know, me being tune starting, I was like, I'm going to strategically put myself in like the fifth vehicle back in the convoy because that one will be safe, right? Uh, so we roll out <laughs> mid morning and bomb goes off like a 155 artillery shell, maybe six feet away. I'm in the, the A driver and the Humvee and the uh, doors at the time. It was those kind of half assed semi up armor ones where you had a giant hole where you could just hang your rifles out right the do-it-yourself armor kits so uh yeah just, this is this is pre mrap days this is before oh yeah yeah there was no armor yeah, class everyone, it was you know strap on armor you know mickey mouse so it did work but just the way the the bomb went off uh, all the fragmentation coming through that opening you know hit my jacket kevlar glasses and mainly my head on the right side um you know jacked me up considerably. Nobody else got hurt in the vehicle. My head stopped everything. Um, <laughs> but I remember... Thank you for your service. Yeah, I remember getting knocked into the driver, and to our right, if you go off, you're going into the river and probably rolling the vehicle. And if you go left, we're going to roll the vehicle and go down the embankment there. So I'm like, telling him to just stop the vehicle. And I, I get out, and uh, you know, like 
right before I get out, I'm doing the system check. I'm like, all right, well, I can feel my toes. I got arms. I can see, and I can see a hole in my uh, goggles. So I'm like, well, I'm seeing the hole, so we're good there. And then, like, start to check all my teeth, jaw, like, you know, doing this in five seconds, right? And I'm like, yeah. got a lot of blood coming out of my head and my mouth. Well, I, I'm good for now. So I, I get out, go to shoulder my rifle to shoot whoever's running away from the scene, right? And uh, I put it up there. It was just mush. I'm like, damn, there's a, there's a guy running over there, and I can't get a good stock well, cheek well, the earbies, my face is jacked up. So Corman runs over and uh, starts treating me. Um, and anywho, got medevac back to the, the FOB and then flown up to Baghdad, Germany, Bethesda. And that started the medical retirement process after that. I, I love how you describe getting blown up and then uh, just anywho, uh, on with it. Any, I mean, obviously getting blown up, any kind of brain damage or, I mean, was it just all lots of blood, flesh, tissue kind of? No, scarring? I mean, I had my uh, sinuses were shattered, uh, skulls fractured, I forget where, jaw cracked, uh, hearing damage, right ear, left ear. Uh, I got some fragments like behind my eye socket. Uh, I mean, luckily... My like, I got a thick skull, so nothing went too far in, right? But other than that, uh, you know, I'm still good. I, I couldn't, I couldn't count to 21 before, and I still can't figure out where 21 is now. <laughs> Again, I go back to it's like, well, anywho, you know, it got blown up, no big deal. Um, gosh, yeah, I mean, my grandfather, and that goes back to World War II, right? Like, he got shot in the neck from like 50 yards out, and uh, you know, ever since I was little, he's like, well. You know, at least nobody's shooting at you and you're alive, so you're good. And I remember thinking of him, like, well, here I am. I'm alive, so I'm good, right? I mean, dwelling on it or thinking, you know, poor is me, not going to do anything. Yeah, that's, I don't know if it's just the media or, or, or what it might be in life. It seems like that's kind of the, the general mentality of things today, right? Like, mo you have every right and every excuse to be poor pitiful me, I got blown up, but you're 180 degrees out and you are just going out there and crushing things in life. What, what drives you? I mean, is it, is it the fact that your grandfather and you have that history there knowing, Hey, just suck it up buttercup. And like, it could yeah, be worse. I mean, I think that was it growing up with that. And I'm like, I mean, just my personality in general, if there's nothing you can do about it. Then don't dwell on it. Don't complain about it. You know, always improve your position to make things better for you and those around you. Yeah, that's, that's spot on. I think that's, um, again, you, you have the easy out and you're definitely not taking it. Um, and hearing that hopefully, yeah, I mean, everyone's struggling with something, you know, in the end you're not getting shot at and blown up. At least probably most people. Listen yeah. And to I'm this, not, so. not knocking the guys that are always like, that always have their hand out, like pours me or like, I'm a disabled veteran. I'm like, just by you saying that you are mentally like you're lowering yourself compared to everybody else. If you are leading a conversation with, I'm a disabled veteran, like, unless you're missing both legs, and I'm not bashing everybody, but like, you know, my friend Clint trial, you follow him on IG, you know, active duty Marine lost both legs last year. That guy's still out there leaning forward, balls to the walls still. Right. Yeah. Like, and he's got as a valid excuse as anybody to just sit down and take a breather and you know let other people take care of things. But, He's not, he's forward leaning. And I think everybody should be, you know, again, take care of yourself and do what you can for others too. That's inspiring to hear that. How was the transition coming back to this? What was it a difficult transition coming back to the United States and, and getting medically retired? No, I mean, I, I found it kind of, it was easy. I mean, it was, uh, just like you, I'm sure in your first deployment, you get back to the U S and it's like, wow, America, you know? Um, yeah. It, it wasn't hard at all, but you know, I was, I was driven to focus on training and then learn what the, the cool guys, so to speak, do for training because I wanted to start a training company at some point. So I started moonlighting at Blackwater and uh, it was up there for a good year. I thought it could be done better, right? After just objectively looking at everything, customer service, the way things work, the level of training and student to instructor ratios, et cetera. So uh started 
kind of looking for who might be willing to dump gas on this fire, right? Who's a patriotic American that actually has disposable income to do another training company the size of Blackwater out of the gate, not start as some mom and pop shop. So uh, I think a month later, number two at Blackwater at the time, former SEAL, awesome guy, like Heart of Gold, he called me into his office in their new $6 million admin building and uh, sat me down. He's like, hey, Steve, there's been six or seven other guys that, like you, think you can go out and do this better. You know, I got word through the grapevine that you're looking to start your own company. So we can't have you working here while looking to do the same thing. And I hope you understand. I'm like, I, I've got it fully understand. So, you know, he thanked me for everything I've done and, uh, you know, wished me well. But it was like, you're, you're going to fail just like everybody else did. You can't beat us. So fast forward a year, right, Rain? And the guy that bankrolled Tier 1 Group, my company, is now looking to buy Blackwater. And we sit down at the boardroom, which is massive. So, And a few minutes later, the whole Blackwater entourage rolls in, Cover Black, Prince, Gary Jackson. And they all sit down right across from me. And then Gary looks up. He sees me. And he just starts laughing. I'm like, I'm back. <laughs> Steve, I, I love it. I mean, that right there, I mean, if, for those who don't know, I mean, I think everyone knows the name Blackwater, but Blackwater, the behemoth, I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars of business they're doing with the government, but I mean, it's a, that, right. that, that is a David versus Goliath uh, type scenario there. And I guess not being yeah. intimidated. So, I, mean, I, I was able to get T1G to the size of Blackwater just on the training side in five years. Do you talk about what you're doing now or no? Um, Just supporting different folks in and around DC. I mean, it's yeah. kind of hard. I normally just tell people I'm a plumber because that kind of like ends the conversation and nobody really cares about a <laughs> plumber. So <Yeah. laughs> not bashing any plumbers out there, but just like, okay, I know what you do for a living. So yeah, there's um, you know, to explain I mean, it. it. Yeah. It's interesting. The nice thing now is uh, I'm nimble enough now that I've uh, the brothers and Arms foundation or something pops up. I can jump on it and just take care of it and devote a week's worth of time or however much time is needed and then uh allow me to establish Raider Air, which is a uh subcategory of Brothers in Arms Foundation. So Raider Air is taking guys like yourself, you know, pilots on the civilian side that got that have aircraft or the capabilities to fly other people's aircraft and Yeah, that's incredible. Leveraging the network. I love it. Everything you've done, man, it's it is a, an incredible journey and just really a matter of, of two decades, you've done a bunch of stuff and still doing a lot of yeah, great I mean, work. It's, it's fun. And I met you too. I mean, that's freaking highlight of life, right? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that. The bar is pretty low there. We need, we need to find you some new hobbies or something. I mean, but no, you that's true. sitting in your plane once and I was like, this is awesome. This guy gets to do this for a living. Where do I sign up? No, I think that, that is the one thing. It, it's funny. Um, I think, you know, you get a lot of people that ask you advice and I think it is like one of the things you don't realize when you're young, but like every person you come in contact with, like there's gonna be a lot of chaff out there. Like you'll never interact right. with them again, but then, you know, if you meet everyone and you put forth your, your best foot and your best energy, um, you never know what relationship that's going to develop. And my, you know, definitely the time on the air show circuit for me was one where you just come across people from all walks of life. And, you know, <laughs> yep. you, you, you build friendships and you build a network um, and again, if you just, if you don't put forth effort, it's never going to happen. Um, and I think that's, Correct. That, that's the the big takeaway is that you got to put forth effort and, uh, and then if you it, be a good person, be a good dude or do that, like you just never know where it's going to lead and the relationships you're going to build and what the journey is going to become. Yeah, no, I mean, it's fun. I still haven't figured out what I want to do when I grow up, but uh, <laughs> I'm not growing up anytime soon. Dude, yeah, Steve. Thanks for giving me you know an hour plus of your time. I know you got a few things rolling, so uh, it was good to catch yeah, up. Yeah, no, I'm mean, happy to happy to help and wish you success with the podcast. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, likewise, Steve. Again, I appreciate you taking the time to come on here today. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the interview. There is a special question and answer session up there on Patreon.com backslash the Afterburn Podcast for those at the uh, patch and director ops level if you're looking for additional content swing over to patreon.com again if you're enjoying this podcast hit subscribe leave me a review 
See you in two weeks with Shiv Wilton, the A-10 demo pilot. But until then, don't bring a week.